Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, August 7th, 2020. And the Wisconsin State Fair is canceled. Anybody paying attention to the world of state fairs knew that. Uh, but they are doing a drive through so you can go and get your cream puffs. So we will be taking Baby Hulk to get cream puffs in a few hours for lunch. Um, wanted to talk about the Smart Money, Dumb Money Confidence Index. And we'll talk about the unemployment numbers that came in today and about the market in general. And we're going to talk about quantitative easing because I know everybody's just dying to know what the hell that really is um, because I think that there's a lot of misperceptions. And um, ultimately, we will realize that there is an end to how much the Federal Reserve can do uh, when we take a look at a chart of Japan. But for now, smart money, dumb money, and people are always like, well, what's the dumb money? And the dumb money is all the small little retail investors who don't know what the hell they're doing. Pretty simple. Uh, the smart money is generally the money at the family offices and the uh, more sophisticated institutions that, uh, and to a large extent, the hedge funds uh, that move with a little bit more sophistication, that actually understand a lot more of what they're doing. And the dumb money is the people who uh, just put money into indexes, pick out stocks on a hot tip, um, and start to use uh, call options and margin that they're probably not uh, qualified to use because, hey, I made money on it, so I'm going to keep doing it until they lose all their money which is usually what happens at some point. So we have talked about alligator jaws over and over and over again. When alligator jaws form on almost any chart, that usually means that there's going to be a snapshot. And so we have seen the smart money, the big money, gradually sell in strength of the market and the dumb money just buy, 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 buy. It's never worked out well for the dumb money when the smart money is selling because the smart money is much, much bigger. It comprises somewhere in the range of 70 to 80% of the total market cap uh, and an ownership of stocks. So when the smart money is selling, there's very little that the dumb money can do other than sell to other dumb money and look for what is called the greater fool. So, at, at some point, you always run out of greater fools. Why is that? Because small money is small and it runs out of money. Pretty simple to understand. This is one of the things that dumb money does. Dumb money doesn't properly hedge. They just buy, buy, buy. So we have an equity put to call ratio of 0.41. That means that for every four puts that are bought, hedging, there is 10, actually it'd be out of 10, um, basically have a two to one ratio, a three to two ratio of calls to puts. So right now you have, I'm trying to think of what the numbers would be here. Um, you'd have your calls far outweighing your puts. Usually this number is up near 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So it's about half what it normally is. And we can see that on various charts. So if you go to market harmonics and there's a lot of websites that do this, I just like the way this one's laid out. You see that the put to call ratio, which normally runs in here, and it's not always at point, at one or, or, or point nine. Point seven eight usually is is pretty common. Point eight. Um, when we're way down here, and this is CVO, uh, you can go and find the for equities. Comes way down here. This is the one I was talking about. Point seven point eight, right in there. That's normalish. 
So now we're way down here. Nobody's hedging. So what did I say a few weeks ago? I was talking to a guy who made tens of millions of dollars as an investor with Morgan Stanley in a hedge fund. When do you know that the bull market is over or about to be over? When everybody thinks it's a bull market. Now, people are saying, well, I'm scared, but I think a lot of people are self-censoring. They're saying they're scared, but I remember my dad always told me, don't so much listen to what people say, pay attention to what they do. And people are buying stocks, at least the small money is buying stocks. So how are they doing that? Well, that market harmonics I just had up showed that it's actually mainly kids buying calls. So that's where we're at. We have a lot of kids buying call options. They believe that if they buy call options, that they are forcing, and this is a group think thing. I mean, they talk to each other on Reddit and social media. They believe, and if you go into their, to, the, to some of the trading rooms, they believe if they just keep buying calls, they force the market makers to buy stocks because they have to maintain neutrality in their books. Well, at some point, you run out of greater fools and you can't force the market makers to keep being the greater fool. <coughs> at some point, because they'll just say no and they'll do it by blowing out the spreads on the calls. So if you take a look at the calls and the puts that we've been doing lately, what you can see is that the pricing is all out of whack. So when you sell a put right now, right, you're not getting a whole lot of time value. But when you buy a call, you're paying a fortune for the time value. So we have a problem in the options markets. We showed last week that margin was going up, especially on NASDAQ stocks. And now we have a whole bunch of people chasing gold and gold stocks. And because everybody's afraid of the dollar collapsing. Now, again, there's different scenarios here for the dollar, uh, but right now, we need to really think about what is the Federal Reserve doing? So let's take a look at what quantitative easing is. Central bank, in this case, Federal Reserve, uh, buys bonds, right? And then firms get the cash and they buy other assets or they lend it out if they're a bank. And ultimately, the idea is that you increase domestic demand. And just like tax cuts don't always work because if you do a tax cut from a, oh, where'd my chart go? I think I killed it. There you go. We need to have analogies here. When we cut taxes from very high rates, there's a positive impact. When we cut taxes from low rates and create massive deficits, we get a negative impact. So you have to find balance in your tax policy, right? Same thing happens with currencies. If you print too much, eventually you get to the point where you create monetary inflation. Monetary inflation is essentially the combination of money in the economy and then velocity of money. How often it turns over, how often there's transactions. And we have seen in other charts that we've done over and over again that the velocity of money has fallen off a cliff. I probably have that at my ready here somewhere. Right now, there's not any velocity of money. 
and that's a pretty significant problem. That's beating the economy up. This idea that you can print money, and we talked about this way back in March and April, that you can just print money to create economic activity is for lack of a better word, what a farmer would call it. It's bullshit. So they print money, they print money, they print money, and it pumps the stock market up, but we're not getting economic activity. Well, what happens when COVID is gone or under control? Right? Because Dr. Fauci said it may never disappear, we just will control it at some point with vaccines and treatments. And maybe we'll develop a, a more natural immunity eventually. Maybe somebody smart will figure out how to change coronaviruses uh, through RNA and DNA. They're working on it. They're not doing a very good job. So when velocity of money falls off a cliff like this, what happens when we get normalization with all that printed money? What's, what's the one word answer that starts with the letter I? Inflation. So if we get monetary inflation when the velocity of money gets back to this level, and remember, it's been dropping for a long time as the baby boomers aged. But it looked like it had started to level off because why? We have an offsetting millennial generation that now is starting to earn money and showing their first, they're flexing their first teenage muscles, right? I mean, think of those, those 15 year olds who lift weights for the first time and they, they flex their muscles for you, right? Or maybe even a 12 year old who just decides, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flex muscles for you. The millennials are starting to flex their economic and financial muscles. And as they get income from the boomers, either through taking their jobs because the boomers are going to retire, or inheriting money, because some of the boomers are going to start to die soon, the millennials will start to increase the velocity of money, especially as they raise their 1.7 child households. So when this goes up in a year or two, or whenever that is, we got big problems. And I am not excited about what's going to happen then. So the central bank, when it does this to get us out of a, a cyclical downturn that has a liquidity problem, this makes sense. But we don't have a liquidity problem. We have a disease problem. So there's no shortage of liquidity out there. None at all. It has actually probably gotten to the point where the Fed has jumped the shark. They've allowed all the corporations to extend their debt for five years. They've really bailed out all the, all the public companies, right? They haven't done such a good job with, with Main Street. In fact, the Main Street lending program is barely tapped. I mean, they, they, really, they really haven't cared about the little guy. They, they really just haven't. So they've protected all the big companies that have CEOs that get to take money in stock compensation, uh, right? Stock market's going up, uh, but they really haven't protected the little guy. So they've gotten to the point now where we are at a point where we're probably going to see really horrible bottom-up inflation at some point, especially in scarce goods. And that is not a good equation. We're already seeing um, the inflation hit parts of China's economy, pork prices in particular. So we need to consider this is what's going on. Now, this chart is from a graduate student's paper, PhD candidate, and it's not even the United States. This is describing quantitative easing in Japan. 
Let's take a look at Japan's charts. Here, take a quickie look. Over the last 30 years, we'll see if it gives us that. This is what happened to Japan. They had their boom, they had their crash, and they've done they've done quantitative easing all the way across. They've never gotten back to their highs, and they have rally, crash, rally, crash, rally, little crash. And I think that Japan is setting up for another big crash. That's all they do. They manipulate the market up, it comes back down. They manipulate the market back up, it comes back down. The problem that Japan has is that they're very resource poor and very, very old economy. They probably can't fix their problems unless they completely change the structure of their economy and the way that they do things. But they're stubborn and they don't. And they still have this really tight insider bureaucratic system. They make good Toyotas. So they make a lot of good stuff. But the way their system functions is broken. And it's been broken for 30 years. bring you back to the United States. You take a look at this period here. Oh. And we had the baby boomer boom. Crash from hot money or from the tech boom. Uh, the first tech boom that crashed. Hot money in real estate and a crash. And from here to here, we have printed or borrowed $4 for every $1 of economic growth that we've had. So think about that. We have been borrowing a dollar on the ledger so that we'd have a quarter to spend. Do you believe that's sustainable? Or based on what we just saw, With the Nikkei, what do you think is going to happen? Sure, there are good runs for a while. And then we get those sell-offs. And ultimately, Japan has never gotten back to where they were. And that spike high is probably illegitimate. So maybe you can say, if this is the legitimate range, they're basically just getting back there after 30 years. What happens to us if we keep trying to do things the way the Japanese have done it? It is not inconceivable to get back to this area here. It's just not. Now, will it happen? No, I think that we're targeting this. I think that we get back down to this level relatively soon, in the next year or two or three or four or five. But at some point, all this imagination land has to go away. The tax cuts from low rates to cause deficits, the money printing, the borrowing at four to one, this is all imagination land. And ultimately, destroying the dollar creates inflation at home that not only flows to pretty much everybody except the super rich, 
because they're super asset heavy and they can never spend everything they have. They'll do well. But do we want to live in a society where there's no price discovery until there's a collapse, right? So from here to here, right? From here to here was artificial. And I warned about that in article after article after article. And then we get a collapse. And what do they do? They come in with more artificial. And I'm not saying that everything they did was wrong. I'm just saying that they got to the point where the bailout was essentially successful at the upper levels. Lots of money got skimmed. And now at the lower levels, there's this illusion, there's an illusion that we're doing great. And when, and it's not a question of if, it's a question of when this comes back down, the only thing that we should be wondering is how far down does it come? And does it come down starting next week? Does it come down starting the day after the election? I don't know. But I know this was artificial based on tax cuts and cheap oil. And the cheap oil is probably permanent, so that's no longer artificial. But the tax cuts and the borrowing and the destruction of the dollar and then an event, and then more artificial. How long can you do something that's not real and maintain the illusion? I'm not really sure. But you need to be aware of what's going on so that you can invest in a way that takes, in, takes that into account. Last week we showed that the Federal Reserve's balance sheet started to shrink, but they keep buying treasuries. And those treasuries, like on the last chart I showed you, go into the financial system because the cash goes to the banking system. Ultimately that money has found, a lot of that money has found its way into the stocks but we're starting to run out of greater fools. Why? Go back to the smart money, dumb money chart that I showed. If you're not selling things that are highly appreciated right now, you're a greedy fool and you deserve the 30% haircut, 40% haircut, 50% haircut that you're gonna get eventually. Again, the balance sheet is flattening out. Why? Because the Fed doesn't really have unlimited resources. <clears throat> this is a chart of all the central banks. Look at what they've done. We had debt problems before. All these central banks have just completely ramped up what they've got out there. I mean, it's, it's insane, it's insanity. There is over $20 trillion out there right now that's just made up money. Look what happened back here with just a few trillion dollars of made up money. The only solution for this in my opinion, is to print, not borrow, just do helicopter money and wipe out all these debts. A few years ago, people were talking about a great economic reset, a great financial reset and debt reset. I didn't believe it. I didn't buy into it because I didn't think that we would just keep doing things year after year after year in a way to put us on thinner and thinner ice. It's like being on a lake that has springs in the middle 
and you just keep taking steps to see how far you can go before you fall through the thin ice. That's what we're doing. So the warnings I gave you a year ago that became pounding on the table around New Year's, they're here again. And again, I don't know if it's a month away or a year away. I suspect around the election. A little to one side or the other. So, and, and, and because I know a lot of people are thinking that way, the market could reflect it sooner. Though we got very uninspiring unemployment numbers today and the market's flat. So nothing wants to take this market down because everybody, and if this is how you're thinking, you better rethink it because you'll never beat the big guys when they make their move. And as I've told you, the hedge funds are playing both sides. When they pull the plug, when they pull the carpet out from under you, it's a long way down. So understand how hedge funds work because this is important, okay? Put your coffee down, turn up your speaker, listen. Hedge funds hedge in the futures market, meaning that they have short positions. Because the Federal Reserve has made interest rates nothing, it doesn't cost them anything to own puts, essentially, and to short the market on borrowed money. Margin is actually a better way to short the money right now, market right now, than buying puts. Just the pricing. So they have the short side of the trade, but they also have the long side of the trade. They own calls, they own stock, they own a few ETFs probably. And when they decide to sell into the market strength, which I believe has been happening lately, They'll probably do it all at once. It'll be really fast in a matter of days. It'll be dominoes. The first one will sell, their systems will show that somebody big sold and they'll say, well, shit, I'm gonna get out of the way. Then I'm gonna sell and I'm gonna sell. And then you have a domino of hundreds of hedge funds all selling. Do, 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 do. So they take their profits and with all that selling, what happens next? Price of stocks goes down. Their hedges start to make money too. And the little retail investor, he and she don't have enough money to keep that propped up. The giant investors who have been selling into strength, not only recently, but really over the last couple of years, they're just going to wait for until they can get their price. What is that price? I'm not sure. For sure, here's what I'm for sure about. The S&P 500 get down to the 2700s pretty easy. There's a lot of money out there. I don't know when people like Buffett start to buy. He didn't buy in March. That should be a clue. He bought natural gas pipelines. That should be a clue. From a, from a utility company that all the dividend investors think is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So keep in your head that you've got this huge group of dividend investors who chase yield because they can't get anything at the bank or in bonds. And then you've got this huge group of growth investors who chase the return up because in their head, I mean, it's really gambling to them in their head. Oh my God, I just made 30%. I'm rich or poor, but richer. And they have no concept that that investment can lose 50% quickly. And when this correction starts, 
let's suppose that the president-elect is Biden. Is the Fed going to bail everything out anymore? No, they're going to let it go. Because why? It's a Trump guy in the Federal Reserve. I don't think he loves Trump. But I think he knows that what he's doing is questionable. He's not dumb. He's trying to help his boss a little bit. So why would the Federal Reserve hold the market up after the election if Trump isn't the nomin and the winner? I don't want anything to do with the stock market until we get a good correction. And we don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but we know that the next several months should probably get very, very volatile. So if you're holding anything that's highly appreciated, you need to cut your position by 50 to 75%, in my opinion. I think that whatever your asset allocation range is, right? If 15% in cash is like the highest you'd ever go because you like to be fully invested, then you should be at 15% in cash. And if 50% cash, because you know I like to keep at least half my money in the game, is, is the most cash you'd ever hold, then you should hold 50% cash. And if you're a retiree or somebody who's really defensive or just places loss management, risk management at the very top of your list, I don't think it's bad to be 75% in cash. Now, people go, well, why, should I, why shouldn't I sell everything? Because there's always something that's probably going to do okay. Your job is to try to find it. I think gold and gold stocks are probably in that category. Would I buy them right now? And I wouldn't buy either one right now. I would have bought them back when I said to buy them in January and February, March. But you have to think these things through step by step. How long can the Fed hold the market up? And how long is it motivated to hold the market up? So I subscribed because I've been looking for a forensic accountant and they're expensive. So I subscribed to a forensic accounting service and they don't share their criteria, which irritates the sin out of me. Um, they just give me their grades and which uh, I guess is okay. I'll probably not keep the service because it, it doesn't do what I want it to do, but they have a ranking system. Remember when I told you that virtually none of the companies out there were financially healthy? When I told you that 100 to 150 companies on the S&P 500 could go bankrupt in the next decade? These guys do a forensic accounting using artificial intelligence and like 123 factors to rank companies based on financial health and valuation. Here's their grading, here are their grades. 102 A's out of 4,300. Let's whittle this down to classroom size. If there is a class of 43 kids, that means one would have gotten an A. Seven would have gotten a B. The majority would be D or F. Well, C's, I guess. I can't do math either, right? No, that's right. 28 out of 43. Would have been a D or an F. So what happens here? When you have so few healthy companies, there'd be a lot of carnage. I took a look back at my short calls over the last three years. My short calls have been spectacular. Philip Morris, Exxon, GameStop. You know, even Facebook went down when I said I was getting out of Facebook. And it doesn't always happen right away. And Facebook is hugely recovered, uh, mainly because, you know, Zuckerberg's a liar, cheater, and a thief. Um, and then you have all the money being pumped into tech right now.
if the Fed feels unmotivated to keep printing money, a lot of these companies are in trouble in the next several years. Might not happen quickly. Might just be wave after wave of downside for all these companies. What does that mean? That means the indexes are gonna suck. So your index investor is gonna have a hard time. But if you're weighted towards the A's and the B's, the companies that are financially strong, they have organic growth, probably gonna be okay. Because the money printing probably doesn't stop. Maybe it just changes its nature. Maybe it becomes more middle out from fiscal policy versus top down from monetary policy. In which case, the companies with organic growth are going to do pretty well. Where are those companies going to be? Well, this is my strategy. Now, I looked for some of those uh, Bugs Bunny barbells so I could write right inside the barbell. I tell you what, I looked and I looked and I looked. So if somebody finds one of those Bugs Bunny barbells, so I can do the writing right inside the barbell, that'd be great. But I think this works too. We want growth. Even, even with our dividend stocks, we want growth. Where is growth gonna come from? Technology, and then here, industry that uses tech well. Goldman Sachs wrote in our, uh, a report a couple days ago, apparently somebody mentioned it, that it was in the paper today, right? If there's a, a, a vaccine next year for COVID and things start to get better, say by the middle of the year next year, which is kind of what I'm thinking, a lot of these inflated tech stocks have to have a correction because they're way overvalued. <clears throat> I've been a big proponent of the whole work from home economy. I think that that's a real thing. I don't think it's as pervasive as, you know, I don't think it'll be as pervasive in a year as it is now because we're forced to be at home. And clearly there's a lot of folks who need to get to the office more often. At least that's what the bosses think. So is the idea that Zoom and whoever else is gonna have 100% revenue growth year over year over year? That's silly, right? We already know that the valuations for the market are insanely high. Just insanely high. How high? Well, maybe I have a chart about that. This is Crestmont. I've shown you all sorts of other charts for valuation. This one's Crestmont. If you ever have a chance, go to Crestmont Advisors website, uh, Crestmont Research, excuse me, and you can see their chart posted on advisor perspectives every month. This is the mean. What do we always get? Reversion to the mean. We're way up here now. Way up here now. So there has to be a reversion to the mean. When is the question? Well, you as an investor have to decide how much risk you wanna take. I think the market does unpredictable things all the time. It changes based on the narrative. I've been re-listening re to narrative economics. So when I, walk, when I walk the baby, I turn on narrative economics and we usually do about a, a one mile circle and somewhere in the, the first quarter mile, he's asleep. And he watches the squirrels and the birds and, and then the narrative economics gets to him. And he's like, oh, this makes me so sleepy. And he passes out. Well, the narratives around the market are generally wrong. They are just validating the trade that's out there now that happens to be working. What you wanna figure out is what is tomorrow's narrative? It makes you think that it would be great if there's an article every week 
called Tomorrow's Narrative. Maybe somebody will start writing one. So we want growth. It's going to be in technology, industry that uses tech well. And again, that Goldman Sachs article talks about the transition from overvalued tech to industry that just uses tech well. We saw something like this before, didn't we? When did we see this sort of a transition from the technology companies to the companies that use technology well? After the tech crash, right? Back in 2000, 2001, 2002. I know most of you aren't old enough to remember that. I'm just teasing. But I'm 50. My career started in the 90s. I remember the tech wreck. I remember when Microsoft dropped 80% or whatever it dropped, an Apple, right? Now they've come screaming back, but for every Apple and Microsoft, there's a hundred, literally a hundred companies that went to zero. I don't foresee a hundred companies on the tech side going to zero that are in the major averages, you know, the Russell 3000. But what I do see is valuations becoming more realistic. And as those valuations come back to reality, and again, we talk about this, peg ratio, price to earnings divided by the growth rate. You want a number between one and two. Any number over two is pretty significantly overvalued. Any number below one, investors hate it for some reason. Sometimes the investors are right, sometimes they're wrong. You got to figure that out. But a peg ratio around one means that it's undervalued, but there's interest. That's a good equation because you need there to be interest in your stocks because otherwise they never get bid up. Consumer discretionary, if you can always, you can always pick out the good trends, you're in good shape. And then there's going to be some biotech that does well. And I'm not so sure I like the ETFs in the biotech other than the ARC one. Um, I'm not such a big fan of IBB. You know, we get, we get a touch of big biotech and QQQ. Um, so I think you, you either pick out a basket of six to 12 biotech stocks or you just use the ARC genomic and you trust her to do it for you. It's not a bad strategy from an asset allocation standpoint. On the other side of the equation is scarcity. Why do we want to be invested in things that might be scarce? Because of potential um, inflation, right? So REITs are beat up right now, not as beat up as they should be probably. And commercial REITs, I think, have a whole bunch of remodeling and redevelopment to do. What do we know about remodeling and redevelopment? Who's, who's, who's replaced a bathroom or a kitchen lately? It's expensive. So office REITs, I think, are going to go through a period of transition and I don't think they're unlikely to revisit their bottom. So I would say a lot of these REITs are gonna go back to their March bottoms. And there we'll pick out about a dozen. Just like in biotech, if you're going to find winners, you're probably gonna to have to look for a couple of different things. You have to look for specific companies they have some sort of advantage. And you can either buy a really good ETF like this biotech ETF, um, the ARC Genomic, and they can do a lot of the work for you and sift through things that maybe you don't understand. On the REIT side, I haven't found a good ETF in REITs. So you sort of have to build your own ETF REIT and you're, you should probably own between six and 12 REITs uh, to do that. Uh, to fill out, you know, maybe 
a quarter of your portfolio probably on the high side. But I don't even know if I'd go that high. I think of it more like the gold, where gold was a unique situation. And I think that the gold, you can filter into the REITs. Because the gold investments won't be great for that long, because we're just going to bid them up like idiots to, uh, to where they should be in five years in the next year. Everybody's jumping on the gold bandwagon that I've been talking about for a year and a half. Almost two years now. So gold is closer to the end than the beginning. Probably in the middle somewhere. And I do think it goes to 3,000. Remember back in January, I said I thought that gold would go to 3,000? What did Bank of America just say this week? 3,000. Okay. So you can probably make about 50% on gold in the next year or two. And then you're going to want to sell. But here's the thing. Markets do unpredictable things all the time. It might go up really fast and then come back down and then just kind of plot along. And as people trickle out because they get frustrated, it just never really gains steam again. We've seen that game before. You have to sell those parabolic charts when they happen. So if we get a spike on gold up to 24, 2500, and then people take profits and then it starts to chop, if it starts to chop, you need to probably get out of there. Okay. And the gold stocks, even at $2,000 an ounce, they're making a ton of money. As they do more automation, right? And they, and they continue to go through basically what is a high grading process, right? They're just going for the, cheap, the easiest to get to gold. And in five or 10 years, that'll be a problem for them too. So when these gold stocks spike, um, and I'd love, I'd love to buy them again, um, because they, they really move fast. Uh, you know, you probably want to buy these gold stocks if they get back into the 30s on GDX. Um, and then ride it into the 60s, 70s, 80s, or maybe even 100. But then some point, getting the gold out of the ground becomes harder. Right? It's a scarce material. It's hard to get. So you have to keep an eye on that. And how many years away is that? I don't know. It looks like five to 10. So when does the market adjust for that, right? That's what the technical analysis is for. When does the market start to adjust for the next story, for tomorrow's narrative? That's what we have to pay attention to. And I missed, right? I missed that the fire hose from the Fed was going to create this let's go on margin, let's buy calls, let's just buy, 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 because the Fed has our back mentality among the millennials. I think the millennials have gotten roped in. And I think that they're flighty enough that when they dump, they'll dump fast too. So if you're a boomer who believes in rationality or an Xer who believes in rationality, you need to put that on the side a little bit. And again, I'll use a poker analogy. I won another poker tournament last night. How did I do it? And I was small stacked early because two people sucked out on me. I did it because I anticipate other people's mistakes and I read their psychology. And this is online. I can't even see them. It's more like Neo in the movie The Matrix. I just start picking bullets out of the air because I see the code. I can read better online with poker. That's good for me, since everybody's playing online right now. But I anticipate other people's mistakes and their euphoria and their fear and their greed and their despair in poker, and you need to do it with the markets too. I didn't think that we'd go through this hyper euphoria stage this fast. I misread this one. Here's the nice thing. I kept my powder dry. I've been market neutral. I really haven't taken any losses. 
I'll get another hand to play soon. And the next hand in the market is going to be a correction. And now, I shouldn't say the next. Soon there will be a correction. We might get a spike up first. But you're gambling, you're rolling the dice, you're at the craps table. You know, craps is a great game. I mean, you're almost 50% to win. And it's fun. And the women wear great dresses. And most of the guys uh, who run the, or most of the people who run the poker tables, there's some women that do it now too. They've done it enough. They got enough experience. It's a lot of fun. They say funny things. And even when you're losing your money, you're like, ah, that's kind of fun. Well, it's what a lot of Robin Hood investors are. Oh, wow, I might lose some money, but it's kind of fun. It's gambling. It's one of the reasons why I have the gambling stocks in the recovery portfolio. If MGM and Caesars and those affiliated REITs don't go bankrupt, there's going to be a moment when you can buy them, at least with a little bit of money, and say, I'm going to gamble on a vaccine. And if they're not going bankrupt, and we're getting a vaccine, those gambling stocks are going to go straight up. Because I'll tell you what, remember how I sounded early on in this? And I was like, we got to shut everything down. We got to wear a mask. I'm going nuts right now. I'm cooped up in my goddamn house. I'm telling you right now, if Vegas is open next June, I'm spending the month of June in Vegas. You should probably, and in fact, if it is open, I'm inviting you all out. That's right. WSOP 2021, baby. If, if, if they have it, right? Uh, the Mid-States Poker Tour is trying to open up because there are certain states that where, where some of the casinos are, there's not any disease. But if you have people from a 500 or 1,000 mile radius coming into these casinos, what are they going to do? They're going to go there and the, in the, 5% of the people that have the disease are going to give it to everybody else and everybody's going to take it home. I don't know. We're just brain damaged sometimes. So in any case, materials, fertilizer, zinc, copper, and then alternative investments. Some of the private equity out there, and even some of the private listed private equity, right? Some of the preferred stocks, some of the broken convertibles, there's stuff out there for that. And I haven't really gotten into this stuff since, since 2009. It's been a long time since any of this was attractive and some of it's attractive now. So if you're on the margin of safety investing service, I just created a new chat room for um, preferreds, REITs, and alternative income investments. So that if you're primarily an income investor, you can live in that chat room. Okay. So this is the barbell strategy that I plan to employ. Everything else is on the bar. So you'll have a little exposure, generally through ETFs. Or maybe you find a special case of best of breed sort of thing or somebody who's got a new thing in a different industry. Right. Maybe you buy a consumer staple company because somebody comes up with better toilet paper and it's the new thing. I don't really think that's going to happen, but you get the point. So this is it. This is the barbell investing strategy for the 2020s. There will probably be a special report on this in September. Um, probably be part of the October um, outlook and, and game plan. Uh, but this is what I really want to focus on. Technology, yeah. But industry that uses tech well. That's what the Goldman Sachs article was getting at. There are industries out there and companies out there. Ford. I'm telling you, buy Ford. Buy a little now and buy more if it goes down. Ford's fourth industrial revolution technology is so good. If I can show you the chart to close with. Hmm. I don't know where I put it. Companies, there you go. This 
this is what you need to know about Ford. They're just not a car company anymore. They're gonna out Tesla Tesla. They have better resources. They have more revenue. They have all sorts of assets they can, they can close and sell. And, and because they're a large employer, that gives them leverage internationally, right? And now they're making medical equipment. And I showed you the robots. So for those of you who did not see the Ford robots, I will show you the Ford robots. That's the Consumer Electronics Show. Ford made these. Looks kind of like the Clone Army, doesn't it? Alternative Energy is tech. I guess I could just add that as its own category. Alternative energy is kind of both, isn't it? Yeah, interesting, right? So, yeah, I guess we could put alternative energy on both of these, right? This kind of fits in both. Um, let's take a couple questions and then we'll call it a day. We're, we're almost at an hour. I think that the next wave of money that comes into the market, somebody asked, will the market tr celebrate Trump um, being out if he loses? Um, I think that there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars waiting to come into this market if Biden becomes president. But they're also rational. They're not gonna buy at stupid high prices. They will cherry pick, because that's what they do. And if the Federal Reserve takes the, their foot off the, the pedal, which is what it looks like they've already been doing, um, you know, then you have to have a rationality on the valuations. You can't be overvalued forever. Just can't be. And I'm telling you, everybody with with some real economic chops knows that if you, if you just keep trickling in printed money, you erode confidence in the currency and it beat up the currency and you create a crisis. The smart thing to do, and Milton Friedman told us this way back in the 60s, is one time you print a ton of money and you fix the problems. That's going to be your economic reset. It's going to happen all over the world. At some point, these countries, and I think it'll be us, will lead the way. If the Democrats win in, in November, not only Biden, but the down ticket, and they control Congress, in the next two years, you will see the Elizabeth Warren structural change. And if you don't, Biden's a failure. The only way for Biden to cement his legacy is, is to create lasting change. So, and his wife is all about that. So this idea that Biden's gonna govern from the middle, I don't think it's true. If he does, I'll be disappointed. We need big structural change one time, and I don't mean going socialist. I mean fixing capitalism, leveling the playing field, focusing on the future, not the past, right? Fixing healthcare, which is completely dragging down the economy. If we just fixed healthcare, that would be such a major boost to the economy. It'd be massive, but we let certain people skim. I'm Italian, I understand a skim when I see it. No real thoughts on IBM. They're too big to make me any money. Um, 
I just am not a big fan of companies that are near the top of their S curve. I don't even want to buy Apple right now. So, I mean, would I buy Apple if it dropped down around 300? Yeah, I probably would, just as kind of a core holding. But if that happened, then all of QQQ is beat up. So I'd probably just buy QQQ. I'm really going to focus my energy on mid-cap stocks. Um, small caps are exciting, uh, but mid-caps give you that margin of safety and the ability to be, you know, still double, triple, quadruple in size. If I can find another 10-bagger here and there, I mean, that'd be swell. And, and there's probably a few out there, but people aren't selective enough on their stocks, right? Do I still have that chart up? No. I mean, this, this is, I just, you need to get this into your head. Stay away from all of these, all these C, Ds, and Fs. Now you're accidentally gonna get a C once in a while if you think it's an A or a B, it might turn out to be a C. But if you just focus, right, on the very top quintile, top 10% of the stocks out there, Right? You don't need you don't need to buy an average stock ever. Ever. Am I buying ATT for the 7% dividend? No. I'm buying ATT because I believe that they have a hidden asset in Warner Brothers. And that they're gonna break out above their 20-year range because of it. I'm buying at and because I think the share price is going to double in the next five, six, seven years. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to double my money on the dividend too. Almost. So for the income conscious investor, stop owning the stocks that go sideways. There are all kinds of stocks with upside catalysts that you can buy. CenturyLink, I, I told you to buy it on Monday and it went up 10% on Thursday or something. And, and, and you know, and, and I haven't really pounded the table on, on, on CenturyLink for a while. But we, I saw the chart. I told you I saw the chart. Put it in the article. And if CenturyLink pulls back to 10 again, you should buy it. Don't sell a put on it. Buy it. It's already got 10% dividend. AT&T, same thing. Anytime it's under 30, you should be buying it. Store capital. Now, that I think is the best read out there. Go to their website, read about what they own. Okay, that's three stocks already. How many do you want to own? I know there's a couple of you that own 50, 60, 70 stocks. You can't keep up with that many stocks. Cut it out. That's arrogant to think that you can. And it opens up a whole world of risk. Structure your portfolio in a way that you can keep up with it. I use artificial intelligence and I work 60 hours a week to do this. And I got frustrated this week because it was a longer week than I wanted it to be. And I didn't even get anything written. I, just, I, have, I, I literally have two notebooks full of notes. So when you build your portfolio, conceptualize it as okay, QQQ is my large cap exposure. If I want biotech, I put a little slice into that ARC Genomics ETF. If I really just want a range of, of small and mid caps, I'll buy the ARC uh, Innovation Fund, and that'll give me some of, the, well, some of the genomic companies. But if I really want to overweight biotech, I'll buy the Genomics Fund. Same thing, she's got an internet fund too. I mean, I really like those ARC funds. Um, I, I think that it's a way for you to get a managed portfolio that's better than you can do it in most cases. In, partic in, in, in things that are hard to keep up with and understand sometimes. And she has a team doing it for you. I don't know why the mutual funds are so bad at it. I have ideas. And they've essentially proven me right. They just, they're just poorly structured and they hired the B team because uh, the A team won't work for them. I won't work for a mutual fund company. 
They, they ask me all the time. Headhunters get tired of talking to me. I tell them, as soon as they offer me $400,000, we can talk. They're like, what? I'm like, you can start talking to me when they offer $400,000 a year. Why would I give up my freedom unless they're going to pay me more than what I make? You know? Oh, I can say I work for a mutual fund. Oh, that's so cool. Maybe I'll get on Bloomberg. I've been on Fox Business. It's not that big a deal. Maybe I'll go back just to prove it. Prove the point when I'm skinny again. Uh, ter yeah, the... the No, I'm not buying UUP calls yet. I want to, I'm trying to figure out when the market's going to decide that Biden's going to be the president. It might be the day after, right? Might not be until November. Um, yeah, TER. Uh, what are they, Terraform, Terra? What are they called again? They, did they just get absorbed? Did Brookfield just finally incorporate them? Oh, that's another thing. The Brookfield um, BEP, they got their transaction coming up, I believe, but it's overvalued. So if you own BEP, um, I would probably uh, trim the heck out of it and then buy it back later because it's overvalued by a solid 30 to 50% based on the revenues. It's just bid up right now. This is a great time to take profits on BEP. What do I think of Bitcoin? Um, <clears throat> I think that Bitcoin is going to survive. It is not an asset. It's not an asset. Right now it's a gambling vehicle and it's used for laundering money. And it is supported by the anarchist argument and all the people who like to chant fiat money. Bitcoin is just a digital fiat currency. What, what, what's this backed by? Oh, well, it's got a code. Oh, kiss my ass. Bitcoin will have value when it's accepted as a unit of exchange and it has a more stable value. Now, I think that Bitcoin can drift up against fiat currencies, but the way that it moves now, tell me that it, were, that it, that it looks like a currency right now, up and down 10, 20, 30% a week, right? It's a gambling vehicle. If you're in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies right now, you're gambling. Just accept that you're gambling and maybe you'll do it better. Yeah, I don't think it hurts to have one or 2% of your money in Bitcoin, but not your investment money, your bank money. So if you've got $50,000 in the bank and you wanna you know, put a few thousand dollars in Bitcoin as a hedge and, and to use for digital transactions, I think that's worthwhile. Otherwise, you're just speculating. In good luck, if you're speculating on Bitcoin, immediately go get the book Narrative Economics. All you got to do is listen to it, put it on 1.25 speed. And they talk about how it happened, how the Bitcoin narrative developed. It's junk. It's just another pump and dump scheme. Well, we talked about that. I, I mentioned Zoom earlier. They exist, but you can't have a valuation. You can't have a PE ratio of 100 unless you're growing at 100%. And they're not going to grow at 100%. They had a one-time boom. Their long-term growth rates are going to be more normalized. They probably all need to come down between 30 and 70%. All That whole group of stocks, 30 to 70% decline. ARC funds, take a look inside of the um, ETF um, plug and play. Okay. 
So trailing stops. And I, I don't think it's a bad idea to use trailing stops on growth stocks. Um, on a dividend stock, you can use it, but it should be a lot looser. And your best defense against losses to know what the hell you're investing in, right? Stops are a system. It's, it's, it's for gamblers. Think of when people talk, well, I got a gambling system and it makes me money. That's what stops are. So a trader can use it if you're trend trading. That's what they're for. If you're not a trend trader, you have a better hedge. Just always have 1% of your money in S&P 500 puts to protect you against crashes. And just roll it month after month after month after month. But trailing stops on stocks, if you're not a trend trader, it doesn't make much sense. That said, if you need the warm, fuzzy blanket, I think that 12% is a good number. It's proven to be a good number. Why 12%? Because 5 to 10% corrections are normal. And once it breaks out of that past 10% range, then usually you have bigger trouble and it might go to 20 or 30. So 12% is a good trailing stop if you're a long-term investor. If you're a trader, you know, even tighter between two and 7% if you're a trader. Depends on your time frame. So, all right. So Brandon, so Brandon, you read narrative economics? Yeah, they talk about Bitcoin. I mean, they, they hit it right on the head. It's what I've been saying for a long time. Yeah, I, I do think that tech gets hit with some, uh, some antitrust. We've been preparing for that for a while, right? The main reason I want Google stock is for the baby Googles. The baby Googles are coming, we just don't know when. Did you notice who's selling tons and tons of uh, Amazon stock? We mentioned, I mentioned this early in the year when he started. Jeff Bezos has sold something like seven billion dollars worth of Amazon stock this year and he's going to keep selling selling it to fund his space program he also said that someday Amazon might not even exist I think Amazon is very overvalued I think that we're at peak Amazon now for um, growth rate right so you have to think about why did he buy Whole Foods a couple of years ago? He's a smart guy. It's not because it's a growth industry. It's because it's a staple. Amazon is moving in the direction of being Walmart. A staple stock, not a tech stock. But there is a tech company within Amazon. Away from the retail selling side. What is it? AWS. I think AWS gets spun off and I think it immediately skyrockets. So the reason to own Amazon stock at some point is for the eventual spinoff of AWS. This is why I talk. So when I talk like this, it's because uh, yeah, I know these things and I think it's important that if you're going to invest in a company, you should think about these companies that way. If I'm the CEO of Amazon, how am I thinking about the future of Amazon in the next five years? I'm thinking, I'm buying Whole Foods because the retail side and the tech side don't really go together. So at some point, I'm gonna spin off a staple company, staple, you know, it's gonna be all retail, I pay a dividend. And on the other side, I'm going to take AWS over here and dominate the cloud or be one of the dominant cloud players. And that's my tech company. Maybe that one pays a dividend too. I think that the biggest change you're going to see to, to the tech companies is I, and, and Amazon doesn't buy back shares, but 
I think you're going to see the law changed on buybacks. I think there's going to be a law that's pretty simple, actually. I think it's going to say this. Your buybacks can't exceed your dividends. That's what I think the law is going to be. And they might even put something in there that you can't buy back stock if you're not debt free, not net debt free. So your cash has to at least equal your debts. That'd be pretty, pretty interesting, wouldn't it? Put a restriction on buybacks tied to financial health. Look at this chart again. <laughs> Why are a lot of these companies buying back their stock? It's a skim. It's so the executives get their bonus. I'm telling you, that's what it is. Yeah, I, I think for narrative economics, listening to it is just fine. I don't think you need to read it. Um, but for tech, you know, getting started in technical analysis, which I couldn't even find on audio, um, you, know, you got to read it. So you've got until Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, I think, I don't know, next week sometime. Um, you've got until next week to read getting started in technical analysis. I hope you've all been reading it. It's a, it's a super easy read. It's a thin book. You, you, fly by, you should fly through it this weekend. Because I think that if you read Getting Started in Technical Analysis, whether you become a chartist or not, it'll help you look at my charts and go, oh, I get it. Right? You should all, if you're managing your own money, read Getting, that's why I made it the first book. That's why I made it the first book. And we'll get into the more interesting stuff. So I'm kind of working my way up, right? The first book is Getting Started Technical Analysis. That's the fourth step, right? Technical analysis. The third step is, step is fundamental analysis, right? And that's common stocks, uh, uh, common stocks for uncommon profits. Scuttlebutt, learn about scuttlebutt. See, so Teresa, the, the technical analysis book is not a hard read, is it, right? It's not a hard read. It, it just helps you, it just helps you re wrap your mind around what's going on. You don't have, you know, there's other books to become an analyst. So anyway, Schwager, go to, go to the Facebook page. You know, I've got the uh, book club on both, both websites. Um, go, go there. All right, have a good day. I am going to shower up and I'm going to take the Hulk for his first cream puff. Um, the world's going to get better and it's going to get better fast when it gets better. We just have some slog to get through and um, I don't know how much reversion to the mean we're going to get. I doubt that we go below mean. I think we get there and then we start growing again. I just think there's too much financial firepower in the system, both publicly and privately, for there to be a horrible to the bottom crash, even though there probably should be, given that we're in a depression. But uh, when the world gets better, it'll get better fast. And we want to fill our barbell. Um, one stock, I'll just throw this one out there for you. I agree that Disney is an interesting stock long-term. It's never undervalued. And it doesn't look like it'll ever go under 80 something or 90 something a share. Um, given what they've lost in revenues and how long it's going to take for them to get ramped back up, you know, Disney probably should be trading at $50, $60 a share right now. But you always have to pay a premium for it. So here's something that I would throw out there, and it's similar to the gambling stocks. When we have a vaccine and everybody is more confident about their health, and they've had six months or a year to save some money up, get back on their feet, what do you think is going to happen? Right? As soon as people have some damn right vacation, as soon as people have room on their credit cards again, which are all getting maxed out again. As soon as people have room on their credit cards again, um, I think the travel 
and entertainment skyrocket. Skyrocket. I think the poor people are going to have a good time. I think middle class people have a good time. I think the rich people have a really good time. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, it's just it's just a period that we're going through. Um, the Fed's held the stock market up. At some point, it has to let it do its own thing and allow a more orderly price discovery. And the more orderly price discovery, I think, starts around 2,700 on the S&P 500, um, even if we get close to 2,000 on the S&P 500 for a hot minute. So pick out your very favorite stock, stick with your A-list, focus on 20 to 30 companies that you can keep up with. And it's okay to only have a dozen companies if you're, you know, got a bunch of ETFs, right? You know, but if you, if you want REITs because you're a retired investor or you want that income, or you just believe that real estate's going to become more and more valuable because Biden probably lets 6 million people into the country over the next four years. Um, I, I think that's about the right number in my head, right? Residential is going to do really well. Commercial's got to go through a conversion period, but you'll want to buy the trough because it's still real estate. If Simon Properties does what I think they should do, I think at some point you buy Simon Properties at 20 or 30 bucks a share. And again, a lot of these companies are good companies, but the financials and their growth and the valuation of their stock just don't give us the margin of safety and upside that we want. Neither the protection on the downside nor the upside on the upside, right? The potential on the upside. They're middle of the market stuff. Stay away from all the middle of the market stuff. Get good companies when they get cheap. Get great companies when they get average priced. Stick to a small universe. Use the ETFs to build a great asset allocation. You're going to get another chance this year. Even if you've been sitting in cash too long, like me, you're going to get another chance. Why? Because there's always another shuffle and another deal. Let's finish on that. I like that line. Have a great weekend, everybody.